When you're lost in the darkness, look for the pod. Specifically, the Prestige TV podcast on the Ringer Podcast Network, where we're breaking down every new episode of HBO's The Last of Us. On Sunday nights, grab your battery and join Van Lathan and Charles Holmes for an instant reaction to the latest episode. Then head back to the QZ on Tuesdays for a deep dive with Joanna Robinson and Mallory Rubin. From character arcs to video game adaptation choices, story themes to needle drops, we'll parse every inch of this cordyceps-coated universe. Watch out for mouth tendrils and follow along on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com, Atlassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk. Now. Now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, he's a big puns guy. It's Andy Greenwald! Those were good puns. I was. It was a big pun, big puns kind of joke too. Because you are a big... Oh, there was a pun in your... Yeah, because you're a wow. big, big pun dude. I was always a fat Joe guy. You were a big pun guy. But together, the, the twins with a Z... That's us. We came together. <laughs> this joke would have played better before the world ended in the Last of Us universe. It would have played better if we were in person, but we're unfortunately on Zoom today, Andy. We're recording a little bit before our Monday scheduled release, but uh, we are going to be talking about the Last of Us episode four today. We also, I'm sure, have a little bit of news and notes. How are you doing? I I was okay. I mean, I do think people need to know that CR's new podcasting style, like, kind of like to psych people out that he's about to do an entertaining culture hour conversation with. But like right before we podcast, Chris is like, so have you heard about this Chinese weather balloon that's spying on our missile silos? Also, what's up? Bird flu's coming. I just like to, I just like that to was, fire up the locker room before we hit the field. That, you just froze everyone on the field. God, I was feel, I was feeling pretty good, but thanks to you. Maybe I need to be more vigilant. So you're saying looking at my big, beautiful face with an Eagles hat on the week before the Super Bowl doesn't cheer you up. That's the only bird flu I'm interested in. Andy, do you want to talk at all about uh, some of the DC stuff that you had uh, teased on Thursday's show with Casey I, Bloys? Not to Casey Bloys, but or, or I do. maybe lament the end of Showtime a little bit more? What if we had teased Casey with the DC stuff? Not teased that we were going to talk about it, but just actively trolled him. I mean, what if we had just been like, uh, we're we're going to have a silent boycott of your presence here because of Doom Patrol. <laughs> right. Your silence on the fate of the Blue Beetle movie is deafening. Uh, I, okay, I do want to run through both those things. But I was interested because last week I was, I was floating a take yeah. that in the history, the long and torturous, if not tortured, history of uh, streaming service naming problems, the newly unveiled Paramount Plus with Showtime, mm -hmm. is the worst of all time. And you were like, you know what? This is fake news. You're like, this is a non-issue. It doesn't matter. People will still get their billions when they want it. Yeah. And the naming stuff doesn't matter anymore. I, I was shocked by this take. I was shocked by it. I don't know if this is your new fatalistic attitude <laughs> now that weather balloons are dropping bird <laughs> flu on us. I can't tell anymore what's real. But I just find it interesting from a consumer perspective as well as a corporate perspective because all of this has been half measures, right? Mm -hmm. Like, 
the decisions being made in these on these topics all seem to be half steps, right? Because there's a there's a version of this where if if the corporate leaders, the bobs, if you will, and the honorary bobs, had seen the playing field, the playing field which is currently cratering like the playing field the Steelers were on in the third Batman movie. <laughs> You could say but you could just could, call it Dark Knight Rises. I don't know why you're I like what's so formal about the third Batman movie. I didn't remember what it was called. DKR? Did you call it DKR? Hell yeah, man. In what in which group chat that I'm not welcome to? I, re- I refer to it as DKR to Sean to to fantasy. We talk about Dark Knight come- Rises a lot. Because of Bane or because of Heinz Because Ward? specifically of the sequence at the beginning with Aiden Gillen. I guess you didn't listen to the uh, Sky Trash episode of The Big Picture, but specifically Aiden Gillen's saying, I'm in the right. CIA! Where's Bane? <laughs> and all that stuff in the beginning. And I love, yeah. Uh, yeah, I really do love the Heinz Field explosion. Is The Big Picture, that's a podcast on the Ringer Network? It is, yeah. Um, look, I, all I was saying is, Run the tape back five years. And they could have just been like, hey, everything's showtime. Shut the fuck up. Do you know what I mean? Like, let's just call all of it a thing and be done with it. But all these other interests got in the way where they're like, well, Showtime and CBS are all part of the Viacom Paramount family. Mm -hmm. But then Paramount is going to win this war and it's not Viacom anymore. So we really want to remind people that Paramount is a thing, even though I don't think historically uh, Joe and Mo Popcorn... Um, that's the that's the couple that I'm choosing. It, you know, non non gendered could be any direction uh-huh. couple that's just going to the theaters. You know, just watching content. Do the popcorn family uh, do they eat popcorn or do they find that kind of weird? It gets in their teeth. Yeah, and they don't they don't like that. <laughs> they, bring, they, they they bring their own snacks. They bring their own snacks a million percent. Um, I don't think they care about the historical brand value of Paramount the degree that the people who took over and wanted to like slap it on everything cared about it. So that's where we end up with CBS. What was the CBS streaming service that existed until like six months ago? I think it was like CBS Plus, right? CBS Interact. I I, Look, I I don't know. The point being, that one went away. That folded into Paramount Plus, as did the Paramount Network. And Showtime was available on it. And now Showtime, which has had its ups and downs, has never been, has always been the little brother to HBO's big brother, but has had hits and Emmy success and critical darlings, is now just becoming Paramount Plus with Showtime, which is about, trips off the tongue as beautifully as FX on Hulu. And I, I don't understand what we're doing anymore. Can't, and wait. suddenly, but wait, piggybacking on our Poker Face conversation last week. Oh. Maybe Peacock had it yeah, right, man. Maybe the cock is right. It's right. I just, we're just going to come up with a name. Relax. You know, because all of these, even when we talked to Casey, like, did you notice he was saying HBO, HBO, HBO were a subscription company? He was still talking about the company and network that we've been talking about and covering or had in our lives for decades. Right. And then he was referring to how Max is also under his purview, which is a different beast with different branded content, different originals. He never said HBO Max as a streaming service or HBO Max Discovery or Mr. Discovery or Zaslav's Folly or whatever we're calling it these days. It's too complicated. Just call it Peacock. I, I do think this time next year, let's just say. Yes. Maybe, maybe next summer, not this coming summer, but the next summer or something, this will all be like a little bit more streamlined. I think that they will probably just call it Paramount+. Plus. And there will be like the Showtime executives will, some will work there. Some of the shows will look like Showtime shows. Yeah. Maybe Showtime will just be a vertical within the Paramount Plus streaming service. The bundling of this stuff probably fine. I, I just see that someone somewhere is going to be like, why don't we just make this one thing? You know, like, yes. And so like, yes. they, even the Hulu Disney Plus ESPN Plus bundle, which I'm sure they make some money off of like as like that digital uh, troika of things that you can have where you, you know, I I feel like that's going to eventually become, do you want to sign up for Disney plus you get ESPN and and FX and Hulu for free with this. If you pay for it. It's just an interesting moment when I think that for some companies, brand recognition, brand familiarity matters more than ever. But at a certain point, if you're going to bank on that, you're going to have to redefine the brand. And what I mean by that is FX on Hulu is called FX on Hulu because what FX does best isn't traditionally Disney stuff. Yeah. 
even though it's all Disney. So if you go to other countries, which you do frequently in your capacity as an avian virologist, you would go on Disney Plus. Uh, I think it would be called Disney Plus. I think maybe it would be called in France. Unclear. Mm -hmm. And one of the windows is, I believe, something called Star, which essentially is FX. And somehow, in the same way that they serve beer at McDonald's there, they can accept the idea that there might be some swears on their Disney content. Um, and maybe we're all being too precious about this, is my, is my larger point. And I, I, I say this as someone who historically is quite precious <laughs> about almost everything. <laughs> what was your favorite season of Californication? The one where Duchovny got a handy but was sad a little bit. Uh, do, do you remember do you, that Do you season? have a favorite all-time Showtime show? I guess that would be Twin Peaks The Return, right? Thank you for that. Yeah. Yes. Would you have been able to pull uh, that out of your back pocket if I hadn't given it to you? I was prepped for that. <laughs> okay. It, it's, it's a steep drop-off after that. No, I mean, Homeland was a very yeah, big show. Ho- Homeland ruled. Uh, yeah. I liked the first season of Nurse Jackie a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, How did you feel about seasons two through nine? I think that they probably, like... That was always Showtime's thing is like whether or yeah. like the, this sort of never ending story of of these shows that go on for eight, nine seasons, Shameless, Nurse Jackie, Ray Donovan, like just Shameless was good. I thought Shameless was good too. But I I did not watch ninety episodes of it, but it was good. What's funny is that they were making TV always. Yeah. You know, they took a few feints in the direction of like Good Lord Bird is something we've talked about more recently is like a um, oh yeah, that could have been on any of the prestige networks. It's fantastic. They took a real flyer on it, and I think it paid off. Um, the Twin Peaks show is another example of that. Uh, I mean, the Twin Peaks reboot or continuation, but um, but yeah, but yeah, like they they basically remember we, we were like Homeland was what did we call it at the time? Slow Food Twenty Four. Yeah, can like, you imagine being like Homeland to Slow Food? <laughs> We were the best, man. It, it, compa- it, it, we, those were our glory years. But I'm just saying, like, their sensibility makes sense again, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's just odd to be like, yeah, we're just going to dilute this even further into the larger uh, Sheridan verse. But I, I, I'm not saying they have better choices, but I am saying this is my new uh, um, island. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm build- I'm, I've, I've started to find some, some structure, some wood, some, like, some, some water sources on this island where I'm saying, Let's all slow down. Maybe Peacock was right. That's my zag. Because like Kaya's it. convinced me. Every time, since we've been <laughs> in the studio, Kaya, Kaya was talking about the, the avatar she's chosen, which I believe was a Peacock. I could be wrong about no, that. No, that's the default avatar. We, we're still waiting on Kaya to finally like, cast her vote and, make, and take a stand on, on something. I, I've already said I have uh, Detective Olivia Benson as my avatar. I don't know why Kaya refuses to associate herself with one of the many characters in the Peacock Galaxy. Isn't there a below-deck why- person you can pick, Kaya? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there is. You know, I fired up my Peacock service last night, and I watched two it episodes is. of Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. Yeah. And I had amazing. a lovely time. I'm just perusing the offerings before I make my decision. Someone from that Kaya show so got... so much to choose from. Someone from that show got incarcerated, right? Um. Yeah, yeah, they did. <laughs> can you pick her you as your like avatar? A, you sound like <laughs> Olivia Benson right now. <laughs> Well, when the shoe fits, I'll just be fascinated to see what, what of Showtime lives on, whether the name Showtime lives on as a channel within Paramount Plus, what they do with that library, and whether or not they continue to make shows, new shows. I'm sure they'll keep putting billions up, but whether they continue to make new shows under that banner. Yellow Jackets yeah. is, is, yeah. Yeah, was a big thing. And then, I mean, I think the channel is still there. You know what I mean? Like, I think it is. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that in the drive home from our Casey talk that I was really struck by was the way he talked about his job primarily. I mean, he said he had, you know, he wears many hats now, but is as the steward of the HBO channel of the home box office. And it seemed as if, I mean, first of all, I think that's healthy and it's producing great shows and I'm not arguing with it, but it did seem like he was considering a uh, consumer who is still paying a premium subscription to fee find on their cable stuff bill on HBO. Yeah. To tune into HBO and yeah. to service that person, as opposed to the suite of HBO programming will fit in nicely next to the Studio Ghibli box and the DCU box on the HBO Max streaming app. You know, and I thought that was interesting. And I I think it's probably useful and producing good content. I also wonder if that is decidedly not the case in a company like Paramount, which has 
reshuffled more aggressively, mm -hmm. even more aggressively than Discovery Warner Brothers has has reshuffled and now is continues to shuffle further, where it just seems like all the programming is streamlined. And yes, to your point, Showtime execs exist, Showtime shows exist, but I don't know how how strong those seawalls between them are anymore. Uh, we mentioned the DC stuff a little bit on Thursday before we got into our conversation with Casey, and I think we kind of teased that we might hit it today. I just wanted to bring up one thing that Gunn did talk about from that uh, press conference that he did, the press availability, that I thought was really fascinating and a bit underreported because obviously what gets pulled out of that is like, what's going to happen with Superman? What's going to happen with Batman, etc. He made this great kind of rallying cry for the centrality of writers in the process of making movies and talked uh -huh. about the main reason why you have so many mediocre superhero movies is because they basically start shooting them without completed scripts or maybe without a script. Yeah, they, they storyboard the action scenes before they hire a writer. Right. And he was just like, that's why there's basically superhero fatigue is because the movies aren't as good because they aren't placing an emphasis on telling the story properly. And they, they get into the end and it turns into people punching each other you know, across a planet for the last 30 minutes. And I have like, I would say, I would say I would, I would be like to call myself a mild James Gunn fan. Like I dig it, but it's not like exactly like my bag. I, I, I really mm -hmm. like Guardians, the first one. And I thought, you know, like I've enjoyed his stuff traditionally, but not like over the moon about it. But I yeah. really would, I salute his statement there. First of all, that's bold to like basically like take a, a, ma a passive like shot at a bunch of like his competition people like in other studios doing, doing that work. We can, we all know the movies he's talking about if you just think about them. And uh, I think it's pretty cool to throw out a standard that you're going to hold the DCU to. Yes. And if they do do that, I think it will make up for the fact that as you and I often say, like these superhero movies just look like shit to us. So that's part of the, the hurdle to get over. But if they can start writing third acts and if they start thinking about these things as holistic pieces of dramatic storytelling, at least it will redeem like the sort of massive project that this superhero industrial complex is a little bit for me. I totally agree with you. And again, I think I, I said this the other day and I'll say it again. Like this was a really promising start for a creative enterprise within the, you know, the larger, it's not even a sandbox, the, the larger cage of franchise billion dollar entertainment it's so simple but it's so fundamental the idea that he that everything that he was saying espoused which is we're going to make a superman movie because we have something that we're really excited to say about superman yeah not because we cleared out a date in 2026 you know and and i know there are creative people who worked on the last generation of dcu movies and people who love them and i i am not intentionally trying to antagonize no, anybody but as but as a casual observer of this stuff my understanding is that there was an aquaman movie and a flash movie because they felt there ought to be an aquaman movie and a flash movie because they were in the justice league and they had these actors you know i i don't know the creative motivation beyond that and when you get to the level that those decisions were being made at in the times they were being made I have empathy for why that is. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll find the reason later. We'll hire the people to come up with the reasons. But when you start a process that ass backward, it's not a surprise that confusing, disappointing things result from it. You know, uh, it's it's just the it's just the nature of it. And and this has infected Marvel certainly as well. And so the clarity with which he 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 introduced these new properties that are coming out was really welcome. And then for me, the second part that was exciting, and I think we said this was a possibility just from knowing his, I think that we can assume some knowledge of his taste and sensibilities and what shaped him, that for both of the projects, the, the, the highest profile projects that were announced, which is his Superman movie. That he wrote, but he may uh, direct, yeah. Right, and Saffron's like, I'm hoping I can convince James to direct it. And it's like, it's like it, this is like the Dick Cheney vice presidential search. You know, like, I, 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 does anyone think someone else is directing this movie? <laughs> and also the, the new DC proper, DCU Batman, you know, and again, this is, he, he, he brought a term that the comic books have used called Elseworlds yeah. to describe alternate versions, multiversal and it's versions pretty, of And it's characters. pretty amazing that like Matt Reeves' Batman movie, which is viewed largely as a, critical and commercial success is now like a specialized project off to the side. 
you know. Well, but but they, I think they did some thinking about why that would be. And both of the projects, which is I think Superman Legacy, it's called, and The Brave and the Bold, which is historically a comic book title associated with Batman, are seem to be drawn from work by Grant Morrison, who I've talked about on this podcast before. I think is one of the true geniuses of our time and and the best or one of one of the best comic book writers alive. And one of the geniuses of Grant Morrison, particularly in their DC run, is kind of the way we talk about Kevin Feige, but even more imaginative, being like, I understand what's good about this. Mm -hmm. I understand what's universal and core, and I'm going to write to that. And I'm going to write to that not using the part of my brain that has made these really transgressive, brilliant, challenging, even some like violent or disturbing comics like The Invisibles or whatever, or Sea Guy or whatever, Transmetropol. No, that was Warren Ellis, but you get my point. <laughs> wow. But be- Sorry. <laughs> no, but I'm just like, the comic book guy just came, came through. <laughs> Take a seat. Read your Bird Flu articles. I got something to say. But like the Grant Morrison Frank Quitely comic You're called reading All-Star Sea Superman. Guy? I've talked about I'm this. I'm reading the New York Times Bird Flu article. We are not the who's same. Who's happier? <laughs> who's happier though? Sea I'm Guy's the one who's really always good. laughing. Come on. <laughs> it's true. Um, this All-Star Superman run with beautiful art by Frank Quitely was just like, Superman is a goofy god. You know, there's something out of step with the times that was also in the Richard Donner version that were in the movie, the Christopher Reeve movie from the 70s. That's what he, st- he went on the stage and he was like, that's the Superman that I still love. And yet, yeah, let's do that. That's such a zag. That's different. That's what I think we miss and what we need in these stories. And then The Brave and the Bold, taken from Grant Morrison's recent run on the character in which Batman was a little bit older, had gone through some crazy shit, which by the way, <laughs> rings true. Yeah. Even as a movie fan and finds out that he has a son who's, you know, who's, who's kind of a spitfire named Damian Wayne, who then will become Robin. Right. So we're doing, we're doing Mando. We're doing Last of Us, right? Like, but with Batman, we haven't done that before. Okay, so now we're doing something different. And also, to your point, the patents in Batman is, he's a little bit younger, he's broodier. That's a different version of the character that I think people can be like, okay, it's not just this is Affleck punching Superman. But the fact that just three months ago, we were like, oh, I guess Superman is back in play because the Rock and Henry Cavill share an agent. Right. What I appreciated about this press conference is they never said this, but I did get the sense that Gunn and Saffron were sitting there being like, guys, we should be better than well, this. Well, no, I think they... No it, disrespect it, to those it actors, honestly but reminds like in terms me, of the characters and the... It honestly reminded me of when like a new GM, like a really good new GM comes into a, a, a team and is like, I know that everybody has like... Anthony Milton? No, but like, let's say he takes over like a kind of mediocre team and it's like, I know you mm-hmm. guys may have like some personal attachment to Pascal Siakam, but like, look... <laughs> like we got to rip the bandaid off here and start over and get back yeah. to like fundamentals and get some draft picks in here. Um, so you're saying trust the process. That's what you're saying here about the DCU. I guess I am. I never thought I'd hear the day that where I did that. But isn't it wild though, to like over the 11 years of this podcast that we ended up when James Gunn, who I believe when we started the podcast was making like trauma, show trauma movies, movies yeah. with porn stars is now like the sage gray beard voice of reason being like, you know what? If you play a DC character on TV, you're also playing them in the movies. Like, what a weird world we have that will soon be ended by Chris's bird flu. Speaking of bird flu. I hope this podcast doesn't age poorly. (laughs) I know, we have like two days before it comes out. I really... This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there.
the friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10 piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Where you want to talk pandemics? Let's let's get into Last of Us. Uh, yeah. Last of Us episode four. Andy, I, I took the liberty to uh, jot down some notes here as a way of recapping this episode, which is called Please Hold hmm. My Hand. Would you like me to, to perform this for you? I love a performance, a CR performance. So, Last of Us episode four. Please Hold My Hand. Ellie and Joel pull a reverse dropkick Murphys and ship out of Boston. And we find them in the notorious and well-documented desert that's between Massachusetts and Kansas. I do want to talk about... Mm-hmm. The Alberta mm. of this uh, show at some point. I guess that's just Ohio. Anyway, Ellie finds a pristine cassette of Hank Williams' greatest hits, which is a classic way to find cassettes after a zombie apocalypse in 2023. Joel is big mad that it's not Pearl Jam's Riot Act because he really wanted to spend more time with that one. Ellie pulls the unfrozen caveman lawyer thing about coffee and pornography, and then we all get a download about Joel's brother who dragged him to Boston, joined the Fireflies because of Marlene, then quit the Fireflies for some reason, and found himself somewhere in Wyoming, which is not very specific. Joel and Ellie go to Kansas City, I believe. Is that right? I I, I thought you were going to begin this by saying, here's how I watch this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make this a big digression. But to me, this episode was really meaningful, particularly at this time of year, because I viewed it through the lens uh, from the perspective of this is a show about two peace-loving, family-oriented <laughs> Eagles fans. <laughs> <laughs> who wander in to the hell scarred dystopia that is Kansas City of what City. was once Burrowhead Stadium? Yeah, and like, and this is how they're treated. Yeah, you know, uh, the humanity of it is what I'm responding to. But please go on. Okay, please so Joel and Ellie go to Kansas City, get into a gunfight with some guys running a slip and Jimmy con on them, and uh, <laughs> then they hide out in a building. Said guys belonged to some kind of resistance unit run by a woman named Kathleen, played by Melanie Linsky which seems Mm -hmm. to be doing some uh, truth and reconciliation on Fedra and the people who may have helped them. Uh, Mason throws us feet first into this, and we learn that Kathleen is looking for a man named Henry, who she believes ratted on her brother in some capacity. And uh, Kathleen has a snitches get stitches policy, and she hammers this point home by executing her old pediatrician. Which was or not just the, like the like the obstetrician, yeah, the guy like who the OBG went delivered her, and she was just like, nah, dog. Uh, so she hammers home that point with the pediatrician, and then she sends her whole clique out on a search for Henry, believing that he's the one responsible for killing these guys, even though obviously it was Ellie and Joel. Uh, while on her hunt, Kathleen and a dude who looks like he really would have enjoyed the Sicario films find a heaving crater that I imagine hundreds of infected are dormantly waiting to burst out. But Kath is like, that's a future me problem, and continues her hunt. Ellie and Joel find some high ground in which to camp out in the form of a tall building and they exchange puns while Joel wistfully dreams of being able to see flaming lips perform Yoshimi in its entirety. (laughs) They are woken by a man and a young boy who I imagine are Henry and his son. This is some of your best work. Thanks. (laughs) You know, the implication that there is just a mushroom colony ready to burst out of the center of this building did make me think that if Craig Mazin and Neil Druckmann were a little more brave and a little more bold. Uh huh. They would take Joel and Ellie to a little town called Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, <laughs> which you and I know is the mushroom capital of the, of the country, if not the Eastern Seaboard. So proud of their oh portability. They just they they just bring their 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 like bring their plums imagine, to market down in Reading Terminal. Can you, can you imagine the first three four days of this outbreak? Like, remember when 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 the new variant came out and Delta Airlines was like, "Ee." <laughs> This is going to be bad. <laughs> wait, wait. Or like when I mean, or when Corona beer was like, well, <laughs> it I, sounds different if you say it in Spanish. Think about my 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 heavy investment in Omicron trucking industries. <laughs> that was a shame. That was that a was a shame. And <laughs> and frankly, I don't do it enough. I don't shout out my cousin B one N one. Yeah, Greenwald, <laughs> who long time listener. You know, it's, it, it's a family name. 
No, I just mean like, can you imagine the first three days where they're like, no, we can pivot. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's like, I think that uh, we also, we make our own honey. Yeah, hashtag not all mushrooms, right? That would have been tough, right? yeah. Guys, okay, uh, right. So off we go to Kansas City. The thing about the show, and this is partially led by you, is that I do want to talk about the content and its characters, but I also uh, want to turn on the bright lights and really just talk about the 2003-ness of 2023. <laughs> well, now this joke so, is getting out of hand because now I've <laughs> created Joel as this guy who did nothing but refresh Pitchfork <laughs> before. <laughs> when clearly, like, that dude just liked watching, like, I guess, like, a Steven Seagal but, movie, like, Face Puncher, and then going to bed. Like, he was not... But also, isn't it a, the biggest tragedy of the show that Joel didn't ever see Pitchfork when it wasn't them posting GIFs of monkeys playing with themselves to review Jet albums? Like, they don't understand that it became a really sensitive arbiter of, like, African disco. Yeah. Like, that that they it really evolved. Like, he'll never know that. But you did this to me. He doesn't being infected. know! <laughs> <laughs> you did this to me where I'm watching this episode and they're walking through a town. So we're like, okay, so we're going to see some more frozen moments. And obviously a lot of those frozen moments are rictus grins on skeletons as they attempted to escape infected cities. But also there's little snapshots in time, like the, the marquee in Kansas City that shows us and reminds us that the last movie ever to be released in the theaters was Ridley Scott's Matchstick Man. I know. Do you know what's, and what's wild about that too? Is no like, more movies. That's the Interpol of cinema. And if that had been the last Ridley Scott movie, it would have been like, wow, that guy had a really prolific career. He did a lot. And instead totally. he made like 30 more movies <laughs> since then. Yes. But I'm also, but that did send me down a rabbit hole of like, oh my God, like Joel doesn't know how the Lord of the Rings trilogy ended. Like he never saw Return of the King. He doesn't, that said, Peter Jackson probably finished the movies. Because yeah, I don't he think shot this two and three. New Zealand. I think he shot two and three concurrently, didn't he? But also, he probably doesn't know this happened. Wait, what do you mean this didn't I feel like... hit New Zealand? Are you just making that call? No, I'm just guessing it didn't. So you think Auckland is just like thriving right now? <laughs> it's just humming. He's just like still pouring over the get back footage. He's like, this is really going to move people who remember the Beatles. <laughs> um, Master and Commander never came out. Lost in Translation. Like I'm looking at the the 2003 Oscar noms. Like there were some good movies. Well, 2003 Oscars would be for the 2002 no, no, the, movie. So you mean the, the... Oh, Chris, how dare you? I'm looking at the correct Oscars. Oh, okay. I did this. I'm looking at the Oscar ceremony that happened February 29th, 2004. Oh, for the 2003 Celebrating the films. cinema right. of the year the world died due to mushroom play. <laughs> and you know what? Seabiscuit's not winning this race. Sorry. Okay. We can talk about... It's like, what kind of America is like Interpol and Matchstick Men? Are the dominant well, let cultural me just, artifacts. I, 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 okay. I fucking really like this show and I I really yeah. like this episode, but I got to get this off my chest. Okay. Finally, some honesty on this podcast. They shot this show in Calgary, right? Or Alberta. Uh, I think that's that's one and the same thing. They're playing a little fast and loose with, with the way the world looks outside of yeah. Massachusetts. Oh, man. Yeah. So I think that that's supposed to be like a kind of desolate strip of Ohio or Indiana or Michigan, I guess, like when they first start getting siphoning gas and stuff like that. Right. Uh, that dude is fucking burning t- rubber. He's like, yeah, we'll be in Wyoming it's, tomorrow. It's so far. It's so far. <laughs> Do you know how long it takes also, to like drive to Chicago? It takes a long time. <laughs> but also, Chris, like, you're, we skipped over this last week. There was a Chiron that said 10 miles west oh, of Boston. Oh, I know. And it was just like... And it looks like Vancouver Island. It's like where Bigfoot Let me tell you lives. something. <laughs> the last time I was 10 miles west of Boston, I saw a dude in a Bobby Orr jersey just openly pissing in front of a Store 24. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, is, it is not rural. And it, it, it's not one of those, like, in 20 years, nature will heal itself. <laughs> like, that's not, that's not a thing. You could, there, there's probably still, like, illegal seafood there. You know what I mean? Like that's that's not accurate. But <laughs> they made it to Kansas City without any problems until one little tunnel. Yeah. So I I thought that that tunnel was. We've mentioned this a couple of times, but it bears repeating that one of the things that I actually find refreshing. I suppose if all television was like this, or if this was the only kind of you know, if this show was on for years and years and years, I might get a little bit bored of it. But uh, yeah. after many, many years of watching people be like, I need to drive over to this person's house and talk to them about whether or not we're bad men. I really enjoy the puzzle-solving, task-oriented forward momentum of the show 
uh, a lot, you know. And so the idea of okay, this tunnel is this you can't drive through this tunnel. You could walk through it, but that would probably be dangerous. Or if you drive back all the way around to get back on another highway, that's hours and hours and hours. So what you're going to do is go through through downtown Kansas City with a person who's only been in a car for two days of her life. Do you, do you think the people that Joel killed were the get-up kids? <laughs> <laughs> I guess they were get Are you going to talk this about point. this show at all, or are we just going to do this? I think it's fine, because I just want to know so that I can be prepared in that regard. <laughs> I'm just wondering. Like, they... They were having a moment, you know? They were going to sign to a major label. Then the mushrooms happened, and they could have joined a militia. It's not out of the question. Do you think it was uh, uh, Chief's legend, Tony Gonzalez? <laughs> I, these are all fair questions, and we will one day put them to, to Craig Mazin. Do you think it was kick-returning legend Dante Hall who woke them up at the end of the night? I... I Nothing would bring me greater joy than if they just sprinkled in like one rando quasi celeb whose life just didn't really work out. The way Dick Vermeil was coaching that that Chiefs team, by the way. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, that, good that's times. really all we have to say about yeah. that. Um, young, young quality control coach Nick Sirianni hadn't yet arrived. No, I, I think Nick Sirianni City. was gooning out as a as a high schooler back then. So. Um, they get to Kansas City. There's the Slip and Jimmy thing. I do want to talk about one thing in particular that I thought was excruciating, but again, like such a great choice for this show. I, I, I feel like it's not necessarily accurate or even respectful of Mason and Druckmann and their writers and everyone's process to pinpoint moments where it's not as if they went through the perceived expectations of this type of show and just chose option B every time. Although if they did, Dainu, like I think that's a nice way to approach material right. that's been well tried. Right. Yeah. But what really sticks with me are these moments when they make definitive decisions that not just work within the world of the show, but really do signify a creative and aesthetic pivot from expectations. And for me, the moment is when Ellie uses the gun that we've seen her have. Mm -hmm. I don't know how extensive a presence uh, Chekhov has in the curriculum of Fedra school. But at least but they like, they like really laid it on thick. Like I was like, good. It's not just like she peeks in and the guns there. And like, it's like, she's, she does the Travis Bickle in the beginning of the episode. She, she, she's going to use this gun. And then she does use the gun and she uses the gun. Again, they, they make such, they make the right choices. She uses the gun in a moment where it does save Joel. And it is, you would have, you know, you and I have not lived through a dystopia. You would be as discussed well, position to thrive I would not but like this seemed like an appropriate usage um, mm -hmm. and then she has basically paralyzed a scared kid yeah and we hear his horrifying screams and as he begs for his life and begs for his mother and I'm glad the show did that you know I'm glad the show did that you see the tastefulness and the consideration in a lot of different moments you see it when we see, you know, Kathleen is pointing the gun at the pediatrician. When she goes back, we know what she's going to do, but we don't see that because we don't need to. Yeah. That's a good decision. Similarly here, this show needed this moment, not just for Ellie's development and our understanding of Ellie and her and Joel's dynamic, but I think for our own moral calculus of what we value in the fictional world of the show. I was really, I, I was upset by it, of course, but I was also really blown away by the specificity of it. Uh, I'll tell you another thing that I'm blown away by, which is that the show hitting the absolute jackpot when casting on the margins of it. Yeah, so, let's talk about that. Obviously, Murray Barlett and Nick Offerman in episode three got the hosannas and got the attention, and deservingly so. But like this Melanie Linsky part is not like a on its surface... It's so far a big part. People who've played the video game, maybe Kathleen's got like a huge arc or something like that. I have no idea. But she now, and, and it always has, but just like seeing her play so against type for one thing, you know, I mean, obviously mm -hmm. in Yellow Jackets, she's up to some, some dark stuff, but on the surface is this suburban like housewife. To see this woman who was essentially like Josh Brolin from Sicario walking around <laughs> Kansas City and marshalling this militia essentially is and and she just has so much screen presence. 
And you can tell that she is running through like when that guy is like, I delivered you and she actually cracks for a second, but then Mm -hmm. is brought back outside and sees like these dead bodies and just like quickly comes back in and just assassinates this guy. She has like this screen presence now that I think is, it's awesome when you follow an actor for with Melanie Linsky, it's been more than a decade and watch them emerge into another level of their career. And I think somehow over the course of the last few years, especially with the notoriety of yellow jackets, like seeing her in the last of us, I'm like, mm-hmm. this is amazing. Like Melanie Linsky is now like this badass. I think when you were talking before about being a good GM, I mean, that is at play here too, where you take someone who's a clubhouse favorite or a, you know, a, a player's player, like or a chef's chef, like someone who everyone, actors love Melanie Linsky. People who pay close attention love her, not just personally, although she seems like a lovely person, but she is one of those actors who's, like Andrea Riseborough, frankly, who's like reputation within industry circles so far outstrips celebrity. And when you're making a show like this with a budget like this, that's when you can afford to take the chances. And it's not like a, ch- like a risk, but you just take the opportunity, let's say, and say, like, I bet she wants to do something she's never done before. Mm-hmm. And you have the confidence that she's going to be great at it. But you know, she that, still has that 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 quality of, like, humanity. Like, that's a recognizable yep. person doing unrecognizable things. Instant, that's, it's exactly that. And I think that, again, like, you know what? I, I don't want to keep dinging on The Walking Dead because that's something The Walking Dead kind of realized early on, too. Yeah, like, the, um, yeah. With the, what, what's the, uh, what's the, oh my god I'm blanking on the character Carol not, the Carol character yeah, yeah exactly um, not just a tribute to the actor but like uh, this is someone who ostensibly was not like Chris Ryan was not built for this was not made for this moment but makes choices surprises herself and others but never loses that piece of her that's like this wasn't what I was supposed to be doing you know. Um, this is how Chris lives every day, being like, if only. <laughs> Bring it on, weather balloons. Um, yeah, I I loved it. It's also, frankly, such a smart play to be... So, like, when she shows up, there's a... I, I'm in, you know, and but if I wasn't, and you see someone, they get to a town, oh, and there's a militia, and they're going to come... I mean, th- you know... I don't say this dismissively because this exists in all media, but I was going to use the term video game logic. Mm-hmm. Like, well, there have to be some bad guys on this level. Um, but the bad guys don't think instantly, they're bad guys. They think that they're exactly. the and, oppressed good guys. Yeah. But, but also instantly, it becomes more interesting if it's a Melanie Linsky. Yes. You know, it just, it's just more interesting. And now I'm paying attention. Yeah. And that's part of the calculus when you're putting the show together. I thought that was really cool. I also thought, you know, it was interesting when we spoke to Casey, he was talking about the original pilot of this show ending with Joel throwing the body of the kid into the burn pit. Yeah. Um, which is, you know... Hard to imagine uh, you coming it, back from that ar- one. <laughs> an artistic choice. But basically, like, this, talking about the, you know, how much attention is paid to the structure of the episodes. And I thought this was really well done in the sense that there were different moments when it could have ended. I wasn't, like, clock watching when I was watching it. I was enjoying it. But there were moments when I... It, you the 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 mush the pulsating mushroom monster or whatever is underneath. Okay, are we ending there? Are we ending when they're hunkering down for the night? What are, what are when Joel laughs for the first time? Again, just really smart, creative television storytelling. Put the pun book in there. Maybe, maybe that's in the game too. But either way, it's great character stuff. It's subtle. It's not fancy. Like you see what's happening, but it's going to work. And then you get Pedro Pascal to laugh and remember he's a charming guy yeah. he, was, he was Oberon in Game of Thrones he's always okay. cracking people up under that Mandalorian he, suit <laughs> when it, the, the twos of times he's been on set people can't stop raving about him um, it could have ended there but no you end with the discovery of the, the missing guy with the son we saw the drawing of the, them as superheroes yeah. and that is how they're dressed and, and, and the humanity of it and again the show does these little subtle building blocks that really work, which are what you just spoke of, which is everyone thinks they're the good guy. Yeah, and then I also think that the juxtaposition of the the two sort of tracks of storytelling style, like with Joel and Ellie, he is essentially explaining the world to a person who every experience is the first time they've experienced it, right? So you can talk about siphoning gas, you can talk about where you're from, you can talk about what happened when the, you know fungal outbreak first started and what Fedra did and you get these sort of like Wikipedia entries of history 
But then Mason still has Chernobyl in his bag, so he can just mm-hmm. throw us into Kansas City and not explain why these people are hunting people who seem to have helped Fedra and what Fedra did to those people and who Henry is and is Henry so powerful that he's sending mercs in? Like all that stuff is you're you're spinning around. But I like as you as you know, I love being thrown into a story head first and like the jargon and the the history is already in the making. So that that kind of those two different styles I think is really effective in the show. Yeah. And just the queasy making effect on the audience in a really impressive way as you realize that you've been in the car with your new friends and your new friends just gun down people who were just doing their best. Yeah. Just trying to just trying to make a make a buck or make a whatever. Like that's just what else are they supposed to be doing? But it's all live ammo. Would you, you know, it, it's would you get annoyed by the puns if you were rolling with a, a 14 year old across the country? Desolate, would you would you just be I, like, yeah, you got a table of puns for a little while? I mean, well, I have I have two things to say. One, you know, I, I don't have teenagers yet. So but my impression is if they're talking to me at all, it's a win. Yeah. So I, I have to consider that as part of my my thinking. I will say that I am at the point where the children, like they love something called Hamster Banana, which is a one minute and 40 second novelty song with an extreme auto-tune uh, that I'm not going to sing. But imagine, <laughs> but imagine Baby Shark, but weaponized uh-huh. from, like from the same viral lab in, in Wuhan where there was the leak. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Not like where they were like, we, Sorry. we could do this, but we could make it, <laughs> yeah, make it much, much worse. And just straight out of the I pangolin. Yeah, like, and I try just, just fresh cut, you know, you know, when they have the, the, the prosciutto, like the ham leg and they just shave, like that's what we're talking with the pangolin. Okay. Like just the, 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 the freshest cuts. Um, and I'm trying to strike this balance of like, I can't lose, like, I can't let them see how much pain playing this music causes me because I think that's part of the pleasure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I do think, so, I, so I'm, I'm very sympathetic to Joel, especially as he's trying to keep them both alive in an apocalypse uh, that what's coming out of the backseat might be extremely annoying. <laughs> and I also relate it to Joel because this is not, I wasn't even going to bring this up, but I did wake up in a cold sweat at 2.30 a.m. last night with the hamster banana song in my head, <laughs> which is, which then there was no, I had no other choice but then to grab my rifle and patrol the perimeter because what else was I supposed to do? The only other thing I wanted to bring up, aside from obviously the cinematic history that was lost uh, due to this event, is I'm nervous that I I eat a little bit like Ellie. Oh, so you watching okay. her like she's just crushing Chef Boy RD and he's just like oh, slow like down speed? and she's yeah. just like I am slowing down. I've been finding recently that I am done eating before everybody. And I wanted to just do this with you because you've known me for such a long time. Am I a fast eater? Wow. I can't say that I've noticed. Okay, and that's all that matters. Because if you had noticed, you would have been like, yes. Well, there's a couple things. I think listeners know that you and I are big fans of small plates restaurants. (laughs) I just like... Where where it just comes out to They need to course it out, though. I can't course it out for them. No, no, no. But like, if that's cool, like things will come out when they're ready from the kitchen, you know, things are made to be shared. So because that involves the the two of us or like with whoever else we're with, like somehow splitting three scallops five ways, the speed doesn't factor into it. Yeah. But I, but then but one that person curious, gets a then. giant tangine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that, so that's why I think the only true test of this will be on Super Bowl Sunday, we each at the same moment crack our cans of, of SpaghettiOs uh-huh. and then see what happens. I don't know. I just feel like I'm getting a ferocious appetite as I get older. Are you getting picked? Like, are you getting picked on for this? Is it, are people being like, no, are you taking food off others? Plates? It's more that I just- am like, Oh, I'm done eating. And my wife or whoever I'm with is like, still like chatting and like sort of still grazing on their, their salad uh- or something like that. I'm like, Oh God, I thought like I just, just, just bodied this. No, no. Here's what I'll say. Um, I don't think of you as a fast eater. I think of you as a strong decision maker. <laughs> and what I mean is when you're done with anything, whether it's a meal or a conversation, you're already in the next room. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, so, so we could all be eating. Like when we watched the NFC championship game, like there were, you, you kindly brought bagels, which was great. I did. And then I think we were all eating bagels and I don't think you were eating faster. 
but you decided you were done and the plate was gone. Like you were sitting back and it was done. Yes. You, I, and I rarely see you pick it back up again. Yeah, I'm also you like a big business. like put my napkin on the plate to be like, okay, now I'm done. I don't know. I don't know. I just, it just, this was just like, what? And you, call, you, you called our server over and you're like, didn't you see that I <laughs> put the napkin in, and Zach, our host was like, sir, Fuck this off. is not an Arby's. <laughs> um, anything else you wanted to hit from this episode? It's just incredible because you've just now asked the eyes of a nation to focus on you. Oh God! While while dining, like you're about to travel internationally, and the eyes of the, the United pub. Kingdom can have to keep their eyes on me now. Yeah, you'll be at a pub having a nice le- warm lamb salad with with mint and peas or something. I'm getting and, Sunday roast on Sunday. Well, time yourself. Frankly, <laughs> that's the only thing to be said. <laughs> and report back. All right. Um, anything Do, else you want to say? The timing from this of episode? this. Uh. uh no, I, I, it was exciting just to say that I liked that it was essentially a cliffhanger within the micro universe of this episode. Mm-hmm. I'm happy we're going to be here for a minute because we've been moving. And we, so and we love Kansas City. We, we just want Kansas City to be it. We want it to be well represented. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like as it truly is. <laughs> um, like, okay, so the timing of this episode, we're recording this before you leave on your trip. This will air Monday. When is your live event? Do you want to do you want to plug? Oh, that? thanks. We're like we're fifty minutes into the podcast. I mean, but I'm doing a live event with James Lawrence Alcott uh, as part of Pod Live in London. It's in, in King's Cross. You can look at my Twitter feed and see ticket information. We're talking football, but well, soccer. Uh, but we're also talking lots of other stuff. And it's part of a suite of shows that we're doing over there. All the Ringer Podcast Network soccer based shows. So Stadio, Righty's House, Counterpressed, Fozcast, and then non-soccer like Rugby Pod. And then James and I will be uh, doing a show as well. So uh, Thursday and Friday night in London if you happen to be free and and want to come see us. Does James watch the Sheridan verse shows? Like, can you finally... We haven't gotten to that that part in a relationship where we're talking about pop culture. I, you know... I, say, I, think... I save that part of myself for you. Thank you. I think traditionally sports and pop culture are a nice combo. Uh, um. Right? We can uh, wrap it up there. How about that? I think that's fine. I think we've done our work here. Okay. I hope you have a lovely week without me. I have. Uh, I will be present on the Thursday show, but not recording it with you. Have you started to think about what you're going to do for the for the opening twenty? Is it going to be a solo Greenwald shot? You love to be surprised, and you know what I've learned. Kaya also <laughs> loves it. The way Kaya asked me yesterday in the studio if I had plans for Thursday yet just made me feel that she's confident <laughs> that I do, and that me not telling her. Is chill. It's chill and good. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody have a great week, and we will talk to you soon. Safe travels, Baranskis. <laughs>